So I was at McDonald's the other day. My kids were hungry. We couldn't go inside yet, so we just went through the drive-thru. But it's crazy how much has changed. I'm sure you've been through a drive-thru recently. It's a much different experience now. There's plexiglass covering the drive-thru window. Like The girl had to maneuver around it to get us our drinks and our food. Everyone's wearing masks and gloves. When McDonald's is worried about health and safety and their workers are wearing masks and gloves, that's when you know something's very serious. It's definitely strange, but what I find interesting in all of this is how normal it's actually starting to seem. Like you can't even go into Costco right now without wearing a mask. And I was one of the first people to say, I'm not wearing a mask. That's stupid. I was one of the last holdouts. But honestly, now it's not even a big deal. We all bought masks. We even bought cute little masks for the, the kids to wear because this is something that's going to last a long time. Some restaurants won't even let you come in to their restaurant and eat unless you're wearing a mask. How you eat while wearing a mask, I don't know. We're going to figure it out because this is just the way it's going to be for quite some time. And I think, you know, this has lasted long enough that we've broken some bad habits. We've gained some new habits cleanliness in general and just an awareness of boundaries is something that's going to last a long time. It, it's going to constantly on be, be on people's minds. Delta announced recently that they have a new policy that's going to be a policy going forward, that after each flight, they're going to sanitize the planes uh, when they get to the airport at every airport across the nation. I think that that's awesome. I feel like we should have been doing that for a very long time. But that's something that's going to come out of this COVID thing that's going to last for a very long time. And I think things will loosen up for sure as new vaccines are introduced, uh, new regulations and things like that will hopefully loosen up over time. But this was global and it was serious and it will go down in our history books. Like this is something that over the last few months, these events are going to change things forever. And the church needs to be aware of that. They need to embrace it and adapt to it without compromising our mission or our purpose, of course. But we do need to take this seriously. We do need to plan ahead for the future, not just the temporary uh, changes over the next few months or even years. But these are things that are going to last for a very, very long time, if not forever. Even as regulations are lifted, people's expectations and needs have changed for good. There are people who years from now will still be turned off by shaking hands with people as you greet them walking into your church. I'm one of them. I welcome a Sunday experience where I don't have to touch 12 different people. There will be people who avoid crowds altogether. There's going to be people who are wary about bringing their kids uh, when they're sick uh, to church, which is great. But there's going to be people who are, you know, have kids that are immune compromised who are going to come to church you know far less often and you know they're going to skip flu season altogether that's just going to be the way it is from now on as a church you need to find new and creative ways to be welcoming and friendly without having to shake hands and hug and get in people's personal space that's just the way it's going to be and if anything good comes out of all of this please god let it be that the church meet and greet time is gone forever the biggest change I've seen over the last few months is churches being forced uh, to embrace church online. And I don't mean just live streaming. I mean having to do church digitally. And you know what? The world saw that church can be done online. They saw that we don't need a building to be the church. And that excites me. I think that that's awesome and refreshing. As stores closed for months, restaurants closed some forever, Government buildings are closed. You can't even call the IRS right now. Amazon stopped delivering mostly everything for months. I still can't get my subscribe and save toilet paper order delivered. I don't know what's going on with that. Everything was shut down except for the church because we're able to continue to do church and be church wherever under any circumstance. And the world experienced that firsthand. And pastors, churches, I know that scares some of you. I get it. I really do. 
but it's sad. And I, I just want to encourage you to continue to put in the work. Look at ways that you can formulate a more practical strategy around making it all of this easier to manage going forward. Because some of this you're going to have to continue, or at least you should want to continue this going forward. Don't discount the opportunity. Don't dismiss this. Putting your service up on a live stream is one thing. It's one thing that you can be doing. And honestly, that's the easiest thing that we can be doing. And it's not even the most important thing that we can be doing right now. We are commanded to preach the gospel for sure. And we are commanded to also make disciples. And we've seen over the past few months the huge opportunity that there is to make disciples where people are at. They're online constantly. And instead of meeting them there, we keep telling them to come to us. Now, the world has seen what we're capable of. Do you think it makes sense to shut it all down and say, you know what, now that everything's back to normal, we need you to come to our building to be a part of this. We're no longer going to come to you and meet you where you are. Come on over to our building if you want to hear the gospel or if you want to be loved on or if you want to be a part of our family. I don't think that that's the message that we want to revert to when this is all over. Do you know that there are Christians and churches in other countries around the world that have never had a building? They may never have a building, yet they continue to be the church. And frankly, most of them don't even have the ability to go online, at least in the way that we do, and we're not taking advantage of it. Now, many are saying just give it time and things will eventually go back to the way they were. We don't need to focus so much on all this digital stuff. This is all just temporary. And that may be true for the most part. So hear me out when I say this. What I'm saying is I don't want it to go back to normal. I think the way it was was broken. Quite frankly, churches in general have become a little lazy and complacent. We've all got the same model. We meet Sunday at 9 and 11. We sing exactly three songs. Then there's some announcements. Then there's the sermon. Then we sing exactly three more songs. We do a, a call for, for giving. Some churches do communion. And then that's it. And if you don't come and participate in that, then you're not really a Christian. Or you're not a good one, at least. And, you know, if we grow our resources and our budget, then, you know, yeah, we can uh, we can introduce some small groups that gather in people's homes. And if you don't participate in those, then you're not a good Christian. And if that goes well, then, uh, you know, maybe we'll get some more resources and budget and we can maybe do some things for the community or try to meet people's needs. But honestly, we'll probably just offer some discipleship classes and we'll do like a serve the city day once a year. All right. I'll stop there because I might go too far and get in trouble with this whole thing. My point is, we have been given a real opportunity to reinvent the way that we do church in a way that might be better to serve people in our communities. And again, the way the world has, like the world has already seen what we're capable of and what we can do, it would be a shame to go back. So. With that thinking, I want to share with you three practical ways that you can continue to engage with people and pastor your church digitally in a post-COVID-19 world. Now, we could cover a lot more than three, but for the sake of time, I'm going to focus on three things here, and hopefully they will get you started in the right direction. So the first thing I want you to think through going forward is continue to offer online small groups. This may look different for a lot of churches, but one of the best things that we saw happen recently was instead of taking a few months off from attending small groups or community groups, we all met via Zoom. Honestly, I've got four kids. It's hard for us to get to Q2 
community group. There's six of us, and then we're joined by four or five other families who also have a few kids. We love it, but it's not always practical. It's, it's not always fun. It's not always easy. But being able to be connected to others in community through Zoom is amazing for a family like ours. Now, I'm part of several mastermind groups for business. These are groups of five or six other business owners. We meet regularly over Zoom. Some of these people I've never met in person before, but they are some of my best friends. We help each other out with our businesses. We pray together. We know each other and we serve each other. I've been part of groups like that for years, and it's all digital. It's all online. Now, there's no reason why your church shouldn't be able to continue to offer virtual small groups in the same way. In addition to groups that meet in person, offer it as an option. That's what I'm trying to encourage you to do going forward. I'm not saying that this needs to be the way going forward or it should replace in-person meetings whenever we can. But I, I just think that it should be an option. And I guarantee if Zoom and the internet existed in Jesus' day, that he would have used it to spread his message. Why not? But he didn't choose to come now. He used any and all means of his time to spread the gospel and spread his message in his time. And he knew that he'd be leaving us to do the rest in our time. We should be using any and all means to spread the gospel and create disciples. And that means that we need to be comfortable with breaking the mold that we've had for church and small groups over the last hundred or so years and try something new and different and not be afraid to change. If our Sunday worship gatherings can be streamed online, then our small group gatherings can, can continue to happen online as well. Now, is there room for people to abuse this method and hide and isolate and retreat from real community? For sure there is. But that happens now already. I've been in countless groups where Bob over there is, is here begrudgingly. Or Frank is missing group once again because he's got a business trip or whatever. Okay, Frank. People not engaging in community is a heart issue. Not a medium issue. It doesn't matter if you meet in person or meet over Zoom. The issue still exists if someone doesn't want to open up and let others in. So don't be afraid to offer that option for people who do want to take it seriously to get in community when they otherwise wouldn't be able to as often or as easily. We want to open up more ways to make disciples, not limit our methods. Now, the second tip I have for you going forward is continue to create content online. Live stream your services or put your sermons online. Sure, I'm not talking about that, though. Honestly, there are so many church streams online right now, and a lot of them are probably better than yours. So I really don't even care if you put yours online now or not. I think it's great if you do, but that's not my biggest concern. There is a huge opportunity for churches and pastors to create content online. And I mean huge opportunity because there's really nothing out there from churches and pastors other than sermons. Now, think through what kind of content people are consuming right now. You've got uh, comedy videos on Facebook. You've got uh, John Krasinski bringing good news through uh, his Facebook show. You've got late night talk show hosts. You've got influencers, you've got how-to videos, uh, then there's Disney Plus and Netflix and Hulu. Quibi is my new favorite. All the shows are 10 minutes long and a new episode comes out every day. It's kind of an awesome, awesome app. Then you've got YouTube, which by far is just massive, by the way. It's the second most visited site on the internet. People are literally searching for stuff like how to read the Bible or what is a Christian. Or should I get an abortion? And the church and pastors are nowhere to be found. Or if you are on there, it's your sermons. Which, when someone's searching for these questions, 
they aren't likely to watch a 30-minute, hour-long sermon video that might touch on the subject somewhere in it, but they will watch a video of your pastor walking through a biblical answer to their specific question. We know this because people are answering these questions. They're just not churches and pastors. You've got the Mormon church creating uh, content out there. You've got 17-year-old girls creating content out there. You've got marketers. You've got uh, guys in their mom's basement. It's all out there. There's tons of content. We're just nowhere to be found with biblical answers to these questions. So create content. Start by breaking up your sermon into smaller chunks. Videos, blog posts, quotes, social images, whatever you can pull out of your sermon to make it more easily consumable. If you make a, a point about one certain subject, break that out into its own video. You're already creating this content each week, so start there and, and break it up into as much as you can to put out on the internet throughout the week. Then, let's get creative. Start a series on YouTube simply answering life's most asked questions. Don't worry about producing a show. Just pull out your phone and do it. Kids screaming in the background, that's fine. Over the last few months, I've recorded a ton of videos in my Jeep. I mean, you got to do what you got to do. The point is just create this content. Take a look at the late night talk shows uh, that were going on during this COVID mess. Take a look at John Krasinski's show. It's literally just done with a phone. And there's very little production value to the way that it looks. The world needs your content right now. They need more than just your sermons. And honestly, it doesn't even need to be biblical content. Not all of it. Yes, preaching the word should be our focus. But you can create content that will introduce people to you and your church. And then they'll begin to follow you. And then they, you may introduce them to some of your sermon content. Then they may get introduced into community groups, either virtually or in person. And then... Maybe they'll begin to believe in Jesus. Maybe they'll begin to come to church, whether your church or a church where they're at. It doesn't all have to start with preaching the gospel straight to them through a sermon. What's your hobby? Do some videos about that. Get people to follow you and don't hide that you're also a pastor. Always bring things around to Jesus. That's what we should be doing as Christians. But trust me, the world is desperate for this kind of content. Lastly, my third practical tip as we're moving out of this COVID thing is to create a digital discipleship plan. Now you might have an assimilation plan at your church or a next steps plan, whatever you call it. You want people to become uh, attenders and then givers, then they'll serve, then they'll become members, uh, then you know they'll go to a small group, then they'll become leaders and so on, whatever path you have laid out. Likely, you have uh, that in, in mind for your church um, through the Sunday experience, or you may even have it written up as a, as a formal plan. Duplicate that strategy, but online. Stop treating online as secondary or just something that you do on the side or something that your assistant Karen takes care of or the youth pastor takes care of. Create a digital strategy that is just as important as your weekend strategy. They should run side by side when it comes to importance and resources. Always have a next step for someone. The beauty of digital methods is it's easy to provide a call to action. Click here to learn more. Download this. Enter your email here. Everything you put out should have some kind of call to action that allows you to follow up with that person and continue to provide value into their lives. If you put out a video, offer a free download, but ask them for their email or their phone number to get it. People are used to this. They'll easily give up that information if you're providing them something valuable. Then follow up via text or email with another helpful download, maybe another video to watch, uh, or invite them into a small group that's uh, a Facebook group that's based on their uh, interests that you've picked up uh, from whatever content that they consumed. From there, invite them to watch your live stream, uh, attend you know, digital small groups or a local small group if applicable, 
From there, someone can invite them to church uh, if they're local, or you can connect them to a church near them. Whatever the process is, have a plan and a strategy for what you want people to do next. Whatever the process is, have a plan and a strategy for what you want people to do next. Treat them just like the family that walked into your lobby on Sunday for the first time. People who are interacting with your content online, they're real people too. The problem is churches and pastors, they hear people like me say, you need to put content online. So they try it out. They maybe even understand the opportunity that's there. So they post a video and they track the likes and the shares and all the stats on it. If it gets a lot of likes and shares, then it's successful, right? And if it gets none, then they deem it a failure. And they go back to focusing on how they can get more people to come to church on Sunday. But if it really does get a lot of likes and shares, does that really make it a success? If it has 10,000 views, for example, that's great. That's a lot of people who saw your content. And that's interesting. Maybe you even presented the gospel in that content, and maybe someone even got saved. Again, that's awesome. And I'm glad that you're putting out content like that. But what about those 10,000 people? Do you know any of them? Do you know what they did next? Do you have a way to follow up with them? Uh, are any of them hurting, suffering, or in need? Are they local even? Plan the next steps that you want them to take and incorporate that into your content. And then you'll be able to continue to engage with those people and hopefully pastor them. Now, I'll end with this. I know some of you are saying to yourselves, I don't have the time and resources to do all this, plus put together Sunday services each week. And to that, I'll just say, I want to be careful here, uh -huh, but I always want to be honest as well. And I think you're lying to yourself if that's the case. I think you're trying to justify not doing more or not doing things differently. If you really believe that doing things the way that you've always done them is the right way, the best way to reach people and make disciples, then who am I to tell you that you're wrong? Continue doing what you're doing, be led by the Holy Spirit, and make good decisions for you and your church and steward the resources that you have. Except that, well, you're, you're probably wrong if that's the case. I think we've got to adapt to the world uh, at some level. And no, I don't mean become one with the world. I mean we need to influence the world. We can't do that by forcing them to come to our buildings and worship services as the only way to reach them. That's one way. It's a great thing. It's a model that has worked on some level for hundreds of years now, and it's still a great thing. But there's more that we can do. There's more that we can do better. Take a look at your priorities. Take a look at the things, taking up your time and the time of your staff. And I'm just saying, maybe prioritize some of these digital options above what you're already doing. Maybe cut the missions budget just a little bit and do some of that mission work online. You can still reach people all over the world. I'd argue that you can do it more efficiently and less expensively through some of these digital options. I talk to my friend in Uganda every week through the WhatsApp app on my phone. Your people can do the same. They don't necessarily ever need to travel there to reach these people. I've, I've been there to Uganda. No one has shoes or running water, but they all have phones with the WhatsApp app on it. It's amazing. If you get creative and let your people innovate and try new things, then I think you can continue to have awesome weekend services as well as an awesome digital experience that can win lost souls, create disciples, and have an impact in our culture and our world in a way that we've never seen before. We just need to do it. Listen, thank you for allowing me to speak to you today. 
I hope that some of these ideas resonate with you or at least get you thinking in the right direction. I really appreciate this opportunity and I hope that this won't be the last. My name is Justin Dean. I'm the founder of a company called The Sunday Group here in Atlanta, Georgia, and we create a ton of resources to help your church think not just about Sunday, but Sunday to Sunday, because that, I believe, is where real discipleship happens. And so I would encourage you uh, to check out our site, sundaytosunday.com. We've got a ton of free resources for you. I encourage you to sign up for our Sunday Insiders email list, where we literally just every month dump a ton of free resources uh, for you with no strings attached, just practical stuff that uh, is going to be helpful. I guarantee it. Uh, thank you again. You can follow me anywhere online at Justin J. Dean. God bless you and your ministry.